noticed that we work a lot with marginalized populations and uh, we kind of felt that that's when we kind of learned the most, uh, when you really get down deep and interact with these people. And we started this class as kind of a way to, to learn more about these populations and to get involved. Um, as some of you may have noticed, homelessness in Seattle is a major issue. Um, these are the results of the one night count uh, in which we participated in. Um, that is me, the bearded wonder, doing the sorority pose. Um, the, that night, um, we noticed that our, the total count ended up being over 3,000 individuals outside. That's not including people surfing on couches, in shelters, stuff like that. So. It's a major issue that covers a wide range of uh, different cohorts of being a clinical practitioner. Um, we kind of tried to get this course going to uh, get people aware of the situation and get them the knowledge um, that will help them with providing care to, these, uh, to this population. The objectives of this course pretty simple, basically to get you involved, have you learned something, and to grow as professionals. Um, we're trying to make this course more and more interprofessional. Um, it is very dental heavy, but we want to introduce concepts that you won't find in dentistry. Um, you'll notice some of you have seen our schedule already. Uh, those of you who haven't, it should be up on healthandhomelessness.com now. Um, we're going to have speakers ranging from uh, nurses to pharmacy specialists, um, a wide range this quarter. So we welcome you to you know, just come and enjoy and learn as much as you can. We partner with several different organizations as well as uh, different professions. Um, some of the ones noted here you, you may have heard a lot about. Uh, UGM is a big one for us, 45th Street Clinic, uh, Mary's Place, Roots. Um, this year, a big one that we've started up is uh, NCTA, which is Northwest Technical and Career, or Northwest Career and Technical Academy. Um, that's up in Mount Vernon. I know uh, some of you may have already volunteered there. Um, it's a great opportunity. We're actually looking for more people for our trip on April 18th. Um, so if that's something that interests you, go ahead and email Evelyn or Liz. The requirements are pretty simple for this. Um, basically, we expect you guys to show up and to do some service. Uh, we'll have five sessions. Uh, they'll all be at lunch on Thursdays. It's basically every other Thursday. Uh, we ended up having to schedule, really, I believe, three in a row um, at the end of the quarter um, just because of speaker availability and stuff like that. If you're unable to make uh, a lunchtime session, we do have makeup assignments online. Basically, we, we record the videos and we'll create a five question quiz. Um, you just go online, you answer it. You also answer a similar evaluation online. And if you submit that, then that counts as your attendance as well. Um, a new thing that we started last quarter is for upperclassmen. If you've already been in this for two quarters or more, um, we're a little bit more lenient on the attendance policy. Uh, for those of you underclassmen who have taken more than two quarters or three quarters, if you're really ambitious and you feel this applies to you, feel free to come and talk to me or talk to Evelyn and we'll see if it applies to your situation. Like I said, we got a lot of outreach. Um, we work a lot with Teeth and Toes, which is our program that we work with nursing and medical students, and we kind of go in tandem working with both uh, teeth and uh, gum issues, and kind of pair that with uh, foot issues, and we see a lot of diabetic cases, um, neuropathy, stuff like that. Uh, we generally do that at Roots, uh, Mary's Place, um, uh, Hammond House, uh, and Emmanuel Lutheran Church. Um, aside from that, we have our various clinics. We also work a lot with medical teams inter international, the MTI bands that you'll see at uh, NCTA and other, other various outreach opportunities. That's who provides the bands. Um, I do also want to make a pitch. Uh, we have a special event coming up on May 2nd. It's with the Samish uh, tribe. 
and it's an anacortis. And right now, uh, Dr. Gandhiara has been invited to come and speak. And we're hoping to get uh, sort of teeth and toes like opportunity down there. We're lacking right now in the toes category, um, mostly because of not having a supervising faculty available. Do you guys know any medical faculty or uh, uh, physician assistant faculty that would be willing to come and help supervise? Please let me know. Uh, but we're looking for volunteers on the dental side, so we're definitely going to do that. So if you're interested, once again, send me a shout. Surveys and evaluations. Um, every uh, session will have a sign-in sheet and we'll have evaluations. Um, sign in for yourself and yourself only. Uh, and fill out an evaluation. This just helps us see how you guys like some of the speakers, um, if you have any comments, any additional questions when you follow up on, stuff like that. The crew. Um, so I know a lot of times there's a lot of questions as to how we can get you know, volunteer hours, you know, what counts as a makeup assignment. I've gotten a ton of emails recently with questions like that. Um, just so you guys know, our sponsoring faculty is Dr. Dandera. I believe most of you know her. She was here recently, but she has a meeting, um, so she's not actually here today. She's usually here every time. Um, for student leaders, you've got me, I'm Keegan, I'm a third year dental student. We have Rika, who I haven't seen walk in yet, but she's kind of the head of Teeth and Toes right now. Um, we're going to have Andrew Johnson uh, start taking over my spikes in the back right there. I wouldn't have blush. Um, and then I believe we also are getting, we should just start walking in. Rebecca is start picking up Teeth and Toes, I believe. I don't know if that's confirmed. That's the rumor right here. We also have a lot of support. Um, sitting right here in the center, we've got Evelyn and Elizabeth, they're our AmeriCorps members. They do all the legwork and basically keep my head above water. Um, we also work with Awa, if anyone knows her, and uh, Dahlia. She's our administrative coordinator. Um, feel free to ask any of us if you have questions um, or go ahead and email us. Also, can't forget David. Uh, last time I gave this presentation, he was actually getting a, an award at the time. Um, so I got this picture and snuck it in. I just like to show it because I think it's goofy. Um, he's the one that actually started this course, and uh, he's graduating this year. But if you see him, tell him you saw a funny picture. If you need more information, uh, we have helpandhomelessness.com. That's where you'll find any of the makeup videos, makeup assignments, makeup evaluations. We also have a bunch of resources of old presentations, basically, that we've had. Um, if you want to go on there and just look around, it's pretty cool. <laughs> um, once again, any questions, concerns, comments, feel free to contact me or Rika. Um, just let us know what's going on. So now I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers for today. Uh, we got Heather Barr and Sarah Sossner. They're coming to us to talk about um, uh, issues with uh, their organization, Healthcare for the Homelessness Network. Um, I'll let them go ahead and explain that. And we, yeah, we're mostly talking about chronic disease and chronic illness in populations. Um, I'll go ahead and let them get into that. I do want to give them a pitch. They had a great video series. That's where I snagged that picture from. And that website, um, it's a seven video series. Uh, I got about halfway through it, and it makes, <laughs> makes my videos look really bad. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to them, and enjoy. Thanks for having us here today, and I'm um, really glad to be back. I came here a year ago or so and spoke to the same group. Different people were here then, but um, we're glad to be back today. Um, we work with Healthcare for the Homeless Network, which is uh, part of the Public Health Department in Seattle and King County, and we have a large grant that we administer and provide nursing and other sorts of medical services in sites throughout Seattle. And some of the ones that you were talking about, Keegan, or places that we have people posted, and otherwise we are very familiar with um, the, the places and the faces there as well. So. Um, kind of cut to the chase, we don't have a whole lot of time. We did this wonderful community needs assessment in 2013 where we surveyed about a thousand people to ask about their risks for chronic diseases, um, principally diabetes and um, coronary artery disease or cardiovascular disease. And we asked them some questions that kind of merging the risk 
tools, do you know the risk tools for from the American Diabetes Association and the American Heart Association? Have you ever taken those risks tools? You can find them online and just ask a lot of questions to see how risky an individual is for developing diabetes or heart disease. And we had an inkling that probably homeless people would be developing these conditions earlier in their life and that they would maybe be more impactful later in their life. I want to just put in a, a little um, pitch for another study that was done, the ACEs study. Are you familiar with that? The Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. Kaiser Permanente surveyed 17,000 people on their, who were um, participants in their health insurance program and found that people who endured certain traumas in childhood had a propensity to become very sick with um, chronic diseases in adulthood, which is kind of a, an astonishing thought that things that could happen to you that didn't have really anything to do with diabetes or heart disease started through traumatic incidences in your childhood, traumatic meaning of those things that had to do with the parent-child bond being disrupted in some way, or witnessing violence, being, being a recipient of violence, and abandonment issues. So it's a really great study to look at called ACEs study, A-C-E-S study. And um, have any, anybody ever heard of it? Yeah, okay, great. Um, anybody in here a social worker or a nurse? Oh, <laughs> no one. So, but I would encourage dentists to really look at that because it starts to give you some information about how to provide trauma-informed care as well, which is really a wonderful thing to know about when you're intervening with people and getting into close personal spaces and how that can be triggering for people. So, just um, I hope that you'll look into that. I want to let Sarah um, go over this, and at the end we'll talk about some ideas we have about how to address the things that we um, uncovered in this, 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 in this um, uh, human needs assessment. Anybody have anything you want to say first, or anything you hope that we'll talk about? Are you just ready to suck it up here and just get it? Okay. Hi. Um, so, um, if folks have questions as we go along, please raise your hand. Um, so we conducted this needs assessment again in 2013, um, and we've been going back to the uh, community organizations that we partnered with, so the folks who led us into their shelter, their day center to interview folks, we've been bringing this information back to say, hey, here's what we learned about your population, and here's how it fits in the larger context of all the people we interviewed. Um, so this presentation is, um, is a presentation that we um, have presented at one of the shelters downtown, um, so I just thought I'd bring the data, um, and not tailor it specifically to you, but just sort of show you what's um, going on out in our community. Uh, so the goals of this presentation are to share findings with you, our community partner. So um, I, we definitely have a partnership in some way with the Toes and Teeth group. We're in this healthcare for homeless network. Providers are in the same places where um, those folks are uh, participating, and um, Seattle and County is all of our community that are living here. Um, and so we also are interested in opening a dialogue about strategies to improve client health. So again, this is something we bring back to shelter workers, day center workers. Um, so our focus, uh, as Heather said when we started this um, needs assessment, was uh, chronic disease risk and prevalence, so the number of folks who have a disease in the adult day center population. Uh, we visited about 15 sites, um, so you'll see some that look familiar, perhaps, if you know homeless services in Seattle. Um, the uh, data that we have, the specific data for our site, um, that I'm going to share with you today are from DESC Main Shelter and Connections, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what those places are like, because um, you'll see their data specifically. Um, and then I have some of the data from the larger um, uh, sample as well. So again, we talked to 1,000 people, and we had about 989 usable uh, interviews at the end. Um, and again, feel free to ask questions um, if you have them as we go along. Just raise your hand, and I'll try to keep an eye out. Uh, so the questions we wanted to address are, um, how many within our target population are at risk? How many have been diagnosed? How many have access to primary care? and what kind of care is used. Um, one thing about homeless uh, populations is that it's pretty hard to get data 
on folks who are homeless, there's a list you can go and uh, look at to draw a sample from of all the homeless people. It's um, you know it's a complex issue. People don't sign up when they're becoming homeless so that you know where to find them when you want to offer them services. And the population that we were most interested in are some of the least visible and countable. So um, this was you know, sort of a dedicated effort to find uh, information about people who are least likely to access services where we might get their medical history. Um, so uh, we asked what you might be asking. Um, why are chronic disease and homelessness linked? Uh, one reason is stress. So um, being homeless is stressful. Folks who are homeless and reliant on uh, social services have limited access to healthy food choices and physical activity, which might relieve their stress, which might improve their health. Um, and many may not know the risk factors or see a doctor for early screening the way that those of us who have our housing and our jobs and things sort of um, locked in, then we have time to think about getting to the doctor for, you know, screenings that we should be, should be getting that uh, homeless folks may not uh, be engaged in that way in their medical care. So diabetes uh, is one of the illnesses we focused on. It's the seventh leading cause of death in the U.S. Um, and there's some pretty uh, terrible outcomes of unmanaged diabetes, um, from dialysis to lower limb amputations, blindness. Uh, and there are a number of risk factors that uh, we are sort of assessed for a person's risk. Those include age, gender, family history, race, ethnicity, person's uh, body mass index, their physical activity level, whether or not they have high blood pressure, gestational diabetes. Um, so this information comes from um, a really great resource that you can find on the web. It's on the National Healthcare for the Homeless. Um, website, and it's sort of this uh, collection of articles about how to adapt your care for homeless people, and so it goes health issue by health issue about how to adapt your care, and so I um, brought up sort of what's it like having diabetes while homeless. Um, so monitoring blood sugar can be difficult, following medication regimens can be hard, um, again, food choices can be limited, um, foot care can be challenging, predictable schedule that you need to have when you're diabetic can be hard. Um, and again, regular medical care can be difficult when you're trying to find a regular place to sleep. Um, so, just cutting right to the results. 20% um, of people interviewed at the DSC main shelter um, identified as having diabetes. Um, and so we did this risk analysis. So we took the Amer uh, Diabetes Association risk self-assessment tool, and we adapted it to be used in sort of an interview setting. Um, we dropped off the question about gestational diabetes, and we dropped off the question about physical activity, um, because it was, we wanted to keep the interviews relatively short, um, and getting into, do you get enough physical activity to make it so that uh, this doesn't increase your risk, uh, seemed a little bit too much for um, what we're going for. So all the scores I'm gonna show you you can sort of uh, imagine, we know that homeless folks have difficulty getting access to adequate physical activity, so you can almost bump all of these up a risk point. Um, so 60% of the people we interviewed at the main shelter had a score of four or, or higher, which means they're at high risk for diabetes. Again, that number gets larger if you think, and many people who have scored a three probably aren't getting adequate physical activity, so they become a four. Um, I give data for uh, another subpopulation that's at DESC, so um, the Conne Connections is a program within DSC that's sort of for uh, working age adults. Um, a lot of people coming out of uh, in, in re entry from the prison uh, system. Right. And it helps people connect with jobs and other social services, and they can get showers and laundry there. So there's some more basic stuff going on, and then there's some more complicated case management things going on. But basically, the people mostly who have been in the prison system that are um, in reentry. Yeah, so they tend to be a little bit younger um, in the Connections program than the DSC main shelter, um, and maybe uh, newer to homelessness, potentially. Um, so just for some context of the difference, um, it's also smaller samples, so um, for the DSC Connections group. Um, but 25% of folks interviewed through that program uh, identified uh, that they have diabetes, and 
on this or for a four or higher. Um, so here we just sort of have a um, table of the risk scores and kind of what percentage of each um, population fell within those uh, scores. And then uh, we also assess risk for cardiovascular disease. Uh, you have a lot of the same risk factors. Um, this one, uh, tobacco use, um, is part of the risk analysis for heart disease, um, as well as high cholesterol. Most of the rest are the same. Diabetes diagnosis also increases your risk for cardiovascular disease. It's the number one cause of uh, death in the US. And so here's what we found. Um, in terms of risk at uh, the main shelter and at Connections. Oh, I'm sorry, this is diabetes still. I went back to slide, maybe. I think my I got a slide mixed up in there. Um, so we have possible cardiovascular disease outcomes um, include stroke, high blood pressure, um, heart attack. And bad teeth, teeth problems, and how they kind of influence you. Um, again, we have some, uh, what's it like to have cardiovascular disease as a homeless person? Um, so managing multiple medications can be a problem. Uh, water pills can cause people to urinate frequently, um, and often uh, there's inconvenient bathroom access, which can be problematic, and public urination is a problem as well. So homeless folks can be caught in this bind of taking their medications and then having um, problems with the uh, side effects. Uh, again, limiting control over salt that's used in meals that are provided at service sites. Um, opportunities for exercise are limited. Um, quitting smoking and managing stress are difficult while homeless. Um, so we found 42% uh, of folks interviewed at the main shelter indicated they knew they had high blood pressure. 33% indicated they knew they had high cholesterol. Um, but 78% had a cardiovascular disease risk score of three or more. Um, connections, we saw similar uh, results. And this is the table of um, results. So um, an interesting uh, part of assessing risk for cardiovascular disease is that um, this multiplier effect of having um, risk more than uh, three or more risk factors. Um, and you can sort of see that the risk, uh, it's not a linear um, function here, that with three or more risk factors, you're 12 times the risk um, as a person with uh, no risk factors. Okay, so just for a, um, Comparison to the U.S. population. Um, again, these the data on the U.S. population diagnosed are going to be um, sort of uh, based on diagnosis codes, and the diagnosis information we have is self-report. So there's going to be a little bit of a comparing apples to oranges there. But just for illustrative purposes, 11% um, of the U.S. population of adults are diagnosed with diabetes. Um, we're seeing 20 and 25 percent who know that they have diabetes in these shelter populations. Um, and high blood pressure, high cholesterol, similarly we see almost double. Um, but the tobacco use should jump out at you. So tobacco use in the U.S. population um, is 19 percent. And in the DSE main shelter and connections, we're at 70, 73 percent. And the sample overall, um, is at 69%, and there has been, um, I, I was able to find another large end study um, published uh, with similar population, day center um, homeless, and they found about 74% um, were tobacco users, so um, the findings are somewhat uh, consistent with the literature. Um, when we give this presentation, we'd like to remind folks that uh, healthcare is just one part of, of of um, the determinants of population health. This is probably um, not news to all of you here. Um, and then we have a little bit of time for discussion. Um, but I want to talk about two questions we ask. Um, Evelyn, did you get a chance to make copies at all? 
Of which one? Of the park one? Nope. The Excel document that I sent. Oh, I no. didn't okay. see that. Yeah. Um, so we asked folks, we went through a risk analysis um, for the cardiovascular disease and diabetes, and then we asked folks um, what kind of uh, activities um, they'd be interested in having at their shelter um, or at their, wherever we interviewed them, and then what their strategies for managing their stress were. Um, and we got some really great information that, um, I'm sorry, I don't have the handouts uh, to share with you, um, but I can talk about those, what we found. We heard lots of people that were interested in um, stress man had stress management techniques that were, you know, um, would promote health. Um, some expressed a willingness to have more activities that would promote health, walking groups, swimming, basketball. Um, but we're sort of in a place in Seattle where we don't have a lot of access for homeless people to the activities that would support their health. Um, so, any questions? Yeah. I was curious um, what effects you've seen of Medicaid expansion from the long term. Um, we have seen uh, a lot of folks getting covered. So, in programs within shelters, we collect data on do you have medical coverage? And in many programs, we went from 20 or 30 percent being covered to about 70 percent being covered, um, and so that's been huge. Um, a lot of the Medicaid programs. Uh, so there are five managed care organizations in Washington that take Medicaid patients, um, and so it's been a little bit complicated for care providers to navigate the five uh, different Medicaid programs that are being administered by these different um, managed care organizations, and kind of what formularies are for, you know, this or that program um, and the reception of homes and stuff. And so there's a lot of education that needs to go on, sort of to um, teach people what primary care is and how they can use their benefits. But it's definitely been a huge change in the way our providers do their work. Anything to add to that? Any other questions? So um, I, I precept a lot of <clears throat> nurses from UW Nursing School and take them out and kind of help them understand what community health looks like and um, <coughs> working with people on their turf looks like. Have any of you guys been out to <coughs> take any um, volunteer work in the community? Can you just like put your hand up if you've been out a little bit? And do you see behaviors sometimes that are somewhat perplexing or troubling to you in the population? It's things that you wonder about how do people arrive to where they are? Does that ever occur to you? You see that here? You see that here in this room? <laughs> <laughs> you can see them coming right into it too. Every day. Every day. So people who are homeless have a higher rates, generally speaking, of mental illness and substance use issues. And working with people can be somewhat um, challenging for those who haven't a lot of experience working with that because you may find the behavior to be so perplexing or irritating or off-putting that you wonder how you can go on. And I just want to ask you, do you guys use motivational interviewing? Have you learned that? This is a really extremely important tool to have in your, you, you have, because... I, I think we, we had it presented to us before, it's not... You had a little skimming of it. Yeah, All right. exactly. You have a little bit of a surface application, but that's um, probably not as deep as you want to go. Um, to be really good at it, it has to be practiced on a daily basis, and generally it's best if you have a supervisor who can help you um, really implement it. It's just a way of getting information from people and talking to people and understanding if they're ready to change. And you know, dentists do a lot of work with that, nurses do, doctors do, when you want to incur a behavior change in a person. Um, we think that we can give them information and that's going to change them. Do you find that that works for you? Okay, there. <laughs> you may know that it's not such a great idea to do a certain thing and you should do other things that you're maybe not doing all the time. Like exercise, everybody loves it but nobody does it on a regular basis it seems or can't fit it in when you're trying to complete your degree. Um, it's really a challenge to get stuff done. And for homeless people it's similar. If there is an understanding that things should be done differently. And we talk to people and they really want to do better. They really expressed a lot of interest in a variety of activities. Like, I was stunned at how many people wanted to swim, but it was hot out when we were interviewing, so maybe that had something to do with it. 
But people wanted to walk more, they expressed interest in jogging, they wanted to work out. People who had prison experience often had experience inside prison working out and they wanted to continue when they were um, you know, liberated. But it's difficult to find places to do these things when you have no money. Um, so one thing that we're really interested in is helping shelters think of ways that they can start um, putting in programming. When you go into some of these places, if you've been to the Union Gospel Mission, you see a lot of sitting around happening, generally. And that's a wasted opportunity, I think. We could be doing some different things if we harness the power of volunteerism and the, the free labor that's associated with places like this. So I think that what you're doing is really great, that you're going out and you're trying to do some activities with people that are ultimately going to help their health. But the thing that's just on my mind so much these days is smoking, because the smoking rate, are you kind of like, whoa, for that 74%? That's really high. That's super high. And people express that they wanted to quit smoking, but how do you think it is to quit smoking when you're homeless? Why do you think people smoke when they're homeless? Appetite suppressor. Yeah, what else? Appetite suppressor. Appetite suppressant, maybe, maybe so. What else? It occupies them. Say what? It occupies them. It occupies them. Something to do with your hands, something to do to make you feel like you're just not standing there. Social. Yeah. Social stuff. You yeah, have cigarettes, you have bartering tool. You can always like get something else if you got a cigarette too. And it's a sort of a way to make a social bond. If you want to share a cigarette. That's that's a common thing. And um, what else? The stimulant to help you stay awake. A stimulant to help you stay awake, yep. Have you heard the linkage between people who have schizophrenia and tobacco? It's kind of a self medication thing to help calm <coughs> voices essentially. It seems to work for people to a limited degree. But it's, what else has tobacco got going on for it? Addictive. Extremely addictive. Extremely, extremely addictive. And uh, when people have heroin habits, they say that heroin was difficult to quit. Cigarettes were 10 times harder. But why do you think that is? Socially acceptable. Socially acceptable, readily available, generally speaking. What is it like now? Like almost 10 bucks a pack. Pretty expensive. But people roll their own too, so there's another way to get it. But, but smoking is a very popular activity. And we went to one shelter that you visit, you know, Union Gospel, and I don't remember how many people we talked to, but the, the rate of smoking was, I, I don't want to say 96 or 98 percent, which was like, wow, that's a lot of smoking going on. And one of the places that we work with has a, a, a smoking area that they're not supposed to have, and they're phasing that out. And one thing that I was really hoping that they would do is find a way to, you know, when you have an addiction, I mean, there's, you guys worked around addiction a little bit, have some classes or anything on addictions. Um, <coughs> it's a great, it's a great class. <coughs> you can get a class on addiction because you will be working with people who have it. Because America is replete with people who have addictions of some type, and um, knowing how to kind of get what you would like people to do behavior-wise around their health and understanding addictions is really a great skill to develop. Um, but. Folks have addictions that they're, they're trying to cope with on the street, and cigarettes are even more addicting than, than, than heroin. And possibly in the end game for cigarettes is this massive indication of how diabetes and, and the cardiovascular disease sort of work together. You understand the relationship between the two, and how tobacco um, increases your blood pressure and just makes everything worse for both conditions. So stopping tobacco would be a beautiful thing to do and to be able to give people something to do rather than smoke instead of just saying stop smoking is a great thing. Anybody familiar with smoking cessation classes? Has anybody in here ever smoked? A couple of you? And quitting is no, no picnic, is it? Um, it often takes a lot of support to, to quit. You don't really have smokers anonymous groups per se, but they do have these smoking cessation classes that usually take about two or three months to complete. And my um, idea that it would be beautiful is to somehow institute an a ongoing sustainable smoking cessation class in the community for homeless people to attend. Usually those classes are held typically one hour once a week for 16 weeks or so. Um, but to have it kind of ongoing and let people enter at any time would be a nice adaptation for people who don't have the sort of schedule that the average working person might have. What do you think of that idea? Would any of you be interested in learning how to do smoking cessation if there was a way to teach that? 
it's really interesting and actually just learning how to do motivational interviewing would be a very wonderful thing for the entirety of your future lives working because it is such an effective tool um, for behavior change. It really looks at the stages of change of the person as readiness to make a change and how to sort of um, let them be in control, which is often difficult for people who want to control other people's behavior. None of us in here like to control other people's behavior. That's really so much easier than trying to control our own. Um, but, you know, this is a, a beautiful skill to have. And it dovetails wonderfully with trauma-informed care that I mentioned. Um, some of the things that you might notice with people who are um, homeless is that their behaviors can be perplexing or maddening or just sad to, to witness, and you wonder why is that person doing that. I have to say, I've worked with homeless people for almost all of my career as a nurse, which is about 30 years, and during that time I was in that position of wondering why is it that people do things that are so obviously bad for them. That just kind of would come to my mind once in a while. If you know this is going to really make that wound worse, why are you continuing to do this? If you know that um, drinking every day results in your falling down and hitting your head, why do you do it every day? These are like naive questions, but they still, you know, questions that beg, right? So um, I was liberated a little bit when I discovered this trauma-informed care idea, which really helps you put um, behavior in the context of a person's entire life. And it, tell, it gives you this one key thought, which is that all behavior stems from a uh, stab at an adaptation. It's a, a way to somehow ameliorate pain or to address some kind of an issue that the person is uh, suffering with. Um, a person who may present like yelling all the time, they're always hollering. What does yelling at? being yelled at do to you? What do you want to do when you're being yelled at by a patient? Stick around? Do you need some more? <laughs> you like it? <laughs> I can't wait to get that guy that was yelling at me last week. And he's coming in today and I'm just stoked because he'll be here and yell at me again. Most of us don't really revel in that and you tend to really drop. And that's probably what that person at one time in their life wanted you to do is back away, wanted people to back away. They may have been hurt badly, they may have been sexually abused or physically traumatized or somehow hurt by others. So yelling is an effective means to push people away. When you're, you know, a little kid that might have worked and maybe when you were a teenager that might have been great, but to sort of generalize that and use that as a way to relate to people and not to unlearn that behavior sort of becomes self-defeating, right? But this sort of maladaptive behavior that you may see people exhibiting has a root in some type of an adaptation. It was at one time effective. You can say the same thing with substance use, that at one time, heroin, you know what heroin is, right? What classification of drugs is that? It's a controlled substance, but it's a narcotic, right? And it's a weapon. It's a painkiller, right? Yeah. Pretty much the schedule one. Schedule one painkiller wiped out. It's very effective, right? Morphine is also a derivative in the opiate, right? So very effective in assuaging pain. People find a way to address their pain when they discover drugs. And most people don't go out saying, I will really want to develop an addiction. That's my goal today is to become an addict. They usually try drugs because they have found other people saying this is sort of a nice way to get that terrible feeling mm -hmm. off of you. So start using that, and they don't bargain that they're going to get addicted. Most people don't um, think that that's going to happen to them, but soon enough they're saddled with an addiction. But that, that desire to feel better um, was rooted in a pretty good reason, wouldn't you say? That becomes a problem later on. So this idea of trauma-informed care, looking at behavior that you see that may be troubling or bothersome, try to wind it back and say, what was this person trying to do with that behavior at one time? How did it work for them? And that can also help you with parts of the motivational interviewing uh, process. To, and it alleviates from you as a practitioner a, a sense of sort of judging people or feeling um, conflicted about what they're doing versus what they say they want to do. But right in that nugget, conflicted about what people say they want to do and what they're actually doing is the spirit of motivational interviewing and how do you work with that and try to get people congruent in their thinking and their behavior. Most people want to do the right thing, but they're having a struggle to get to that right thing. Um, so 
I'm just giving you a big cheer for something that I believe is really helpful to anyone who works with people in any capacity. And it kind of gives you a, a, a way to um, feel more comfortable and feel less judgmental and less conflicted in your relationship with people. Are you excited to go and look, in, in, to look that up on the internet now? A little bit? Motivated. I'm telling you, it's going to help you a lot. Say what? Motivated. You're motivated? Are you, how, how much are, do you think you're ready to go and look that up on the internet on a scale of 1 to 10? <laughs> you're a solid 7. Excellent. Why did you say 7 and not say 5 or 3? Because I'm on lunch. You're on lunch and you're feeling better about things. <laughs> okay, great. Why didn't you say 10? I'm not that good, is it? <laughs> Ten's extreme. Ten's extreme. Okay, he's a moderate guy. Uh, but yeah, that's actually kind of how you do mod motivational interviewing in the most clumsy fashion. I just did a little of it for you. But it's a, it's kind of techniquey, but it also comes real natural. And I can't tell you, people who haven't been paid attention to when you're paying attention to them in a really focused way is magical. And they really will be much more responsive, and especially if you elicit from people their thoughts and feelings about them rather than trying to fill them up with information. When you find out what they're all about and they feel that you're on their team, wonderful things happen. And I want to just tell you one small story about motivational interviewing and um, one of my um, ex-colleagues who was kind of new to it said she was going to try it out on a guy who was doing weird things with a wound that he had that wouldn't heal. He was like putting bleach directly into it or something that's really not, you won't find it in any textbook and stuff that he was doing and he was poking it with things and like paper clips or something. And she said, you know, I think that you really want this wound to heal. Um, maybe some of the stuff you're doing isn't working very well. And he said, yeah, I really do want it to get better. And she says, but on the other hand, maybe you just want to go slam a speedball right now. And she's this really prim little blonde girl, and she just delivers this message about speedball as heroin and cocaine mixed together. And the guy looked at her and he said, yeah! And it was like uh, this like moment of liberation for him, like, oh my god, finally somebody understands me. And after that, she didn't have any trouble getting him to go along with some of her suggestions, because she simply established the fact that I understand that you have a desire that is, is hard to cope with, and certainly probably more fun than learning how to deal with your wound on the, uh, in the real way that should be done. But the, it bridges a gap to be able to um, understand people in that way. So back to this smoking cessation thing, I just, I'm hoping that somebody will get really fired up and um, take it to a higher level and ask the uh, professors or deans of your school to figure out ways that we might be able to implant <clears throat> some kind of ongoing smoking cessation in the community. Because, if, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that in dentistry, that diabetes and, and cardiovascular disease are concerning to you. What do they teach you about that as a dentist? I'm not quite sure, but somebody tell me. Uh, just like there's, there's multiple complications that you can get, and uh, it affects your down there a lot. A lot of people think it's pretty far removed from the mouth, but it's very much related to a lot of your potential diseases and the state of your oral cavity in general. The state of your oral cavity, gingival disorders, um, well, medication medications that might be involved. So the, the mouth is a really vascular region, right? And it has a lot of micro vascularity, and I think that, that blindness that we always point to in, in the kidney failure is the microcirculation being impacted, so your teeth the same thing. So you really want to make sure that your clients stop smoking so they don't exacerbate their diabetes and their cardiovascular disease. And smoking itself has oral implications too, right? Anybody work with anybody who had an oral tumor, tongue cancer, or oral cancer? That's a really horrific um, type of disease to deal with. and. You guys, as dentists particularly, are often the first people who are discovering oral cancers. They teach you how to do an oral examination to feel for tumor development, right? So, we have to stop in about four minutes. Is there anything that you guys would like to ask us about working with homeless people or about those, those findings in our community needs assessment or anything at all? 